on World News Tonight. Aiding Afghanistan, world leaders come together to propose a monetary saving grace. Cooperation meltdown, North Korea plays a balancing act between nuclear dominance and global coexistence. Bolstering boosters, heated debates on the necessity of a third jab takes center stage in inoculation diplomacy. Paddling away, Moscow waters are brightened with a plethora of paddle boats as enthusiasts flock to celebrate water sports. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the updates on the climate crisis. President Biden on the latest stop of his Western U.S. tour restated the urgency with which climate change must be addressed within the country while taking aerial tours of the most fire damaged areas in California. Well, you know, the reality is we have a global warming problem, a serious global warming problem. U.S. President Joe Biden on Monday sounded the alarm on climate change as he toured the wildfire-ravaged states of Idaho and California in his first trip to the U.S. West Coast as president. Biden got a bird's-eye look of extensive damage from the Caldor Fire, which has been burning since mid-August in California's Sierra Nevada range. The Caldor Fire is among nearly two dozen raging across California and scores of others elsewhere in the West during a fire season shaping up to be one of the most destructive on record. The blazes have been stoked by extremely hot, dry conditions that experts say are symptomatic of climate change. We don't stay below 1.5 degrees centigrade in terms of the earth warming. We're in deep trouble. Earlier in the day, at a stop at the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise, Idaho, the president highlighted the magnitude of wildfire damage across the country. 44,000 wildfires, 5.4 million acres burned. First of all, they don't fully understand how big the West is. But more acreage is burned than the entire state of New Jersey, which is a big state. And you know, uh, California, 2.2 million acres this year, already this year. The Dixie Fire, a million acres. The, uh, the, 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 the Calder Fire, 200,000 acres, 1,000 structures. And God knows how many lives risk or lost. Biden last week called climate change an existential threat during a trip to survey the damage from Hurricane Ida in New Jersey and New York and pegged the economic damage from extreme weather events last year at $99 billion. And I'm telling you, it's about time we need a wake-up call. Biden pledged to help federal firefighters make at least $15 an hour and said he is committed to raising the pay gap for firefighters who protect federal wildlands, telling firefighters he met in Idaho, thank God we have you. We have some good news for you. Donors pledged more than a billion dollars to help Afghanistan at a conference in Geneva. Poverty and hunger have spiraled and foreign aid has dripped up since the August 15th fall of Kabul, a desperate situation that means the international community must engage with the Taliban to help the needy. Antonio Guterres expressed some satisfaction at the UN's International Donors Conference for Afghanistan. Today, we already heard clearly more than one billion U.S. dollars of pledges. It represents a quantum leap in relation to the uh, financial commitment of the international community towards the Afghan people. Afghanistan was already struggling with an economic crisis and a drought before the Taliban took over the country. Now the situation is even more dramatic. According to the World Food Program, 14 million people are on the brink of starvation. Some countries say humanitarian aid isn't enough. They want donors to save the Afghan economy and avert a humanitarian crisis. Others want to try and help Afghans, but they want to keep pressing the Taliban so they would respect human rights. 
The UN has reports showing the Taliban have been violating women's rights and carrying out reprisal killings. This is backed by amateur images from the ground. Crossing over to the conflicts in the West Bank, the already high strung tensions between Israel and Palestine may have reached yet another unsteady height as the two territories exchange fire amidst the prison break. Airstrikes rained down on Gaza on Monday. Israel carried out the attack in response to Palestinian rocket fire on its territory for a third consecutive night, according to the Israeli military. Fighting between the Palestinians and Israel has escalated over the past week, after six Palestinian militants escaped from a maximum security prison in Israel on September 6th. Israeli forces have since captured four of the inmates. Gaza militants fired a rocket into Israel on Friday when two of the prisoners were apprehended, and then again on Saturday after two more inmates were caught. The Israeli army said rockets were intercepted by Israel's Iron Dome missile defense system. No casualties were reported. The Israeli military said it struck targets belonging to Hamas, the Islamist armed group that rules Gaza. The recent rise in cross-border violence tests a fragile truce between Gaza and Israel that ended fierce fighting in May. Following a report last month by the UN nuclear watchdog suggesting that North Korea has restarted nuclear activities, the head of the IAEA urged the country to comply with international obligations, calling the situation deeply troubling. International Atomic Energy Agency Director General Rafael Grossi on Monday called on North Korea to fully comply with its international obligations to limit nuclear activities. He pointed to a report from the agency in late August that suggested a nuclear reactor remains in operation. In the report, there were indications of the operation of two North Korean nuclear facilities, the 5-megawatt nuclear reactor in Yongbyon and the site's radiochemical laboratory. According to the agency, the 5-megawatt reactor is widely believed to be at the center of North Korea's nuclear program, essential for producing plutonium for nuclear weapons. The director general said the situation is deeply troubling to the IAEA and that North Korea's nuclear activities are causing serious concern. Urging North Korea to comply with its obligations under relevant UN Security Council resolutions, the agency assured that they remain ready to return to North Korea and play an essential role in verifying the nuclear program. The IAEA has had no access to North Korea since 2009 when the inspectors were expelled and since then has been monitoring the country through satellite imagery. Angela Merkel may be within her twilight years of leadership, but it has been made more than clear that her legacy is one that continues to shine through in many women's hearts, with many remembering the firm leader as a female icon. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has become a feminist icon after 16 years in power, even though the world's most powerful woman has only belatedly accepted that label as she prepares to step down and conceded that gender equality is still a long way off. Alice Schwarzer is a feminist rights activist. She says the very fact of Merkel's existence is a feminist statement. A rare woman in the upper echelons of her conservative, male-dominated Christian Democrats party, the 67-year-old long avoided casting herself as a feminist and has only reluctantly supported some policies pushed by feminists, such as quotas for women in boardrooms. However, as her time in power draws to a close, she has reconsidered her position, speaking earlier this month. So today I can answer the question with a yes and say I am a feminist. Back then on stage, I tried to make the point somewhat more shyly. Today I have thought my answer through more and so I can say yes, we should all be feminists. Wow. Yay! Women and girls say the impact of Merkel, who was often known as Mutti or Mum, has been profound in a country where traditional gender roles are changing slowly. Germans will head to the polls on September 26. On Thursday, Merkel declined to speculate on the outcome of the national election. The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News.
welcome back. The government of the Australian state of New South Wales said a pace of COVID-19 vaccinations had slowed as first dose coverage neared 80%. Let's cross over to other than a World News Press correspondent, Timothy Phillip, who joins us now from Melbourne in Australia for more. Timothy. Yes, Shana. Authorities there are urging people to get their shots or risk missing out on freedoms when curbs ease next month. Premier Gladys Berejiklian has promised to relax some restrictions for state residents once 70% of adults have received two vaccine doses. So far, about 46% of the state's adult population has been fully vaccinated. Australia's vaccination drive was expanded to include around 1 million children aged 12 to 15. The country is scrambling to control outbreaks of the highly infectious Delta variant that began in Sydney in June. It has since spread to Melbourne and Canberra plunging nearly half the population of 25 million into lockdown. A total of 1,257 new cases were registered in New South Wales, while neighbouring Victoria reported 473 new infections, its biggest one-day rise for 2021. Back to you, Shana. All right, thank you. That was other than our World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. Starting in Israel, a number of countries have been rolling out third shots of the COVID-19 vaccine, commonly known as booster shots. With the Delta variant threatening many countries, even those with high vaccination rates believe a third shot after five months is needed to maintain efficacy. However, numerous scientists disagree. The debate over the need for booster shots of the COVID-19 vaccine is heating up. On Monday, top scientists at the World Health Organization and two departing scientists from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration wrote in an article in the Lancet Medical Journal that booster shots are not needed for the general population. The journal said that six months after getting two shots of the vaccine, the chance of hospitalization had only risen slightly for those over 75 years old. And that as for now, immunity levels after six months didn't show much difference. This goes directly against some of the decisions by countries around the world, including the U.S., where booster shots will be rolled out in a few days. Of course, the decision of which booster shots to give, when to start them, and who will give them will be left completely to the scientists at the FDA and the Centers for Disease Control. But while we wait, we've done our part. We bought enough boosters enough booster shots, and the distribution system is ready to administer them. The authors of the journal added that booster shots coming too soon or too frequently could even be dangerous to recipients, and that using the supply to administer first shots to unvaccinated people would save more lives. New Zealand extended a strict lockdown in its largest city, requiring 1.7 million people living in Auckland to remain indoors for at least another week to snuff out small outbreaks of the highly infectious Delta variant of the coronavirus. New Zealand will keep its largest city locked down for another week. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern announced the extension for the city of Auckland on Monday. But the cases are telling us we have more work to do. The next week will be critical in providing us with the additional assurance we need. Alongside active cluster management, we are going to continue with testing focused for now on seven suburbs of interest. The country has been battling to control the spread of the highly infectious Delta variant. Strict curbs on Auckland's 1.7 million people will remain on offices, schools and public spaces until September 21st. New Zealand was largely virus-free until an imported case from Australia sparked a snap nationwide lockdown. The outbreak has infected nearly 1,000 people so far, mostly in Auckland. New Zealand's lockdown and international border closure since March 2020 have been credited with reigning in the virus, largely freeing up day-to-day -day activities for people. But Ardern has been criticised for a slow vaccination program with only around 30% of the population vaccinated so far. In Nigeria now, the families of 75 previously kidnapped children were blessed with a safe return amid a crackdown on the abductors through the Nigerian military. 75 children have been released in Nigeria's northwestern Zamfara, a state official has said, after their abductors came under pressure from a military crackdown. 
gunmen took the children from the village of Kaya on September the 1st. More than 1,100 children across the region have been taken since December. Authorities say heavily armed gangs of so-called bandits carry out the kidnappings seeking ransom payments. Zamfara has been one of the worst hit states. On September the 3rd, authorities ordered a phone and internet blackout, while security forces targeted the gangs. Since then, the state has largely been cut off from the outside world, and the military has given little information. Governor Bello Matawali said he was happy to see the efforts they are making are succeeding. A spokesman for the governor said no ransom had been paid for the children's release. Since Sunday night, several Nigerian media outlets have also been reporting that bandits attacked a military base and killed 12 soldiers. A defence spokesman neither confirmed nor denied the reports. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A Seco gas station roof in Texas could be seen balancing precariously amid heavy rain and wind before giving in and collapsing as tropical storm Nicholas strengthened into a hurricane. A sale of Australia's biggest airport moved closer as an infrastructure investor group won permission to conduct due diligence on Sydney Airport Holdings after sweetening its takeover offer to $17.4 billion. Israel's Prime Minister met Egypt's president for talks on bilateral relations, marking the first trip to Egypt by an Israeli head of government in a decade. Ahead of his departure, the Israeli leader noted the importance of dialogue with Cairo. Lebanon's new government held its first meeting with a call by the president to resume talks with the International Monetary Fund to help kickstart its recovery from one of the world's worst economic crises in more than a century. Chief Executive of Hong Kong Special Administrative Region Carrie Lam said the newly released plan for further developing the Shenzhen Hong Kong Corporation Zone in Kwanghai will bring the new development opportunities to Hong Kong and rally the unity of Hong Kong compatriots and stimulate patriotism. South Korea's top court upheld a lower court's ruling that Mitsubishi Heavy Industries needs to compensate South Korean wartime forced labor victims. The Japanese government reacted by saying the Supreme Court's ruling has the potential to cripple Seoul-Tokyo relationships. The Japanese government on Monday warned of the relationship between South Korea and Japan souring in the future. As South Korea's Supreme Court backed the seizure of Mitsubishi Heavy Industries' Korea-based assets. This particular case dates back to 2018, when the South Korean top court first ordered the Japanese firm Mitsubishi to financially compensate South Korean victims they forced into backbreaking labor during World War II. The court ordered Mitsubishi to pay 100 to 150 million Korean won, or 85 to 128,000 U.S. dollars, to each of the five victims involved in the suit. But Mitsubishi refused to pay. They said all restitution had already been paid in 1965 by a treaty signed by the two countries. So then the victims and their surviving members took the case to Daejeon District Court, asking for the seizure of six Mitsubishi patents and two of their trademark rights in place of their compensation. The Daejeon Court ruled in favor of the victims, but Mitsubishi once again rejected the court's decision and brought the case to the Supreme Court earlier this year. After several months of deliberation, finally, on Monday, South Korea's Supreme Court rejected Mitsubishi's appeal. The top court said that the original ruling was reasonable and did not violate any part of the Constitution, laws, orders or legislation. But the Japanese government wasted little time chiming in on the matter. Chief Cabinet Secretary Kasunobu Kato said Monday that South Korea's Supreme Court should come up with more proposable solutions because otherwise the ruling will sour Seoul Tokyo relations even further. And finally tonight, hundreds of paddleboard enthusiasts brightened the waters of Moscow's rowing canal with a flashy masquerade to enjoy the last warm days of this autumn. The participants had a chance to show off their costumes as well as to take part in a friendly race. While some came to choose their costume based on looks for fun, others made a statement with their choice. 
Some participants noted that the Moscow Marathon was recently cancelled and that they want to support the organizers of the famous marathon, Moscow Marathon, a traditional run that draws thousands of amateur and professional runners each year, got cancelled due to COVID-19 restrictions. Paddleboarding became increasingly popular in central Russia over recent years, although there are no seas nearby. Enthusiasts sailed on many lakes, rivers and city water ponds. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Dani Duvitanamasam will be back tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.